everybody, it's Ashley. I am sorry it's been a few days. I have had a lot going on personally, um, so I'm gonna catch up on my comments, but I just, it made me realize how much I admire people who are able to film these videos with a smile on their face when you know that they must be going through stressful moments in their life, and I am just, I was not able to, but then what pushes me is how much I really just love doing this, every aspect of it, from filming to talking about books, discovering new books, editing and uploading and the whole creative side of it. So, uh, and it brings me such confidence to really just push myself out of my comfort zone. So it's something I wanna keep doing. I don't ever think that I'm really great at reviewing books, but I wholeheartedly love books. So it's neat to just record that journey anyways, but, um, Last week was really tough in life and I won't go into it because there's just no need. Um, I just want to talk about what I read in the month of February. I ended up reading 18 books this month, which is really amazing. I think that sometimes when you're going through a lot, books are just a form of escape. So that's what I did to cope. Um, oh, and this band-aid, I want to quickly mention. Knife Mishap, Rogue Avocado Pit, the Avocado One and my hand did not win, so excuse the band-aid. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that I read on this stack, I, if you guys remember in January, I did 10 lesser known books on my TBR and I wanted to read those in March, which I managed to do, so that's amazing. The first one, and ended up being one of the best ones, was The Prisoner and the Chaplain by Michelle Berry. And I don't know if this was just like a matter of not expecting you know, what this book ended up being like. The cover is kind of subdued and plain, and the back just sort of sounds like it's gonna be more of a meditation on life. Um, but it follows two characters. There's a prisoner who is on death row. He's about to be executed in the morning, and he is spending his last 12 hours with a chaplain. So this book follows those 12 hours. So the prisoner is given a chaplain just as a resource and to have someone to talk to over the 12 hour period. And then the chaplain also sort of figures out the wishes of the prisoner. But in this case, they end up having a bond during that time period. And they both have secrets within and they have both committed crimes. And it really becomes a discussion of what crime is worthy of capital punishment. And it, you can have great conversations on our justice system and family upbringings and backgrounds and how a completely normal upbringing can still result in something that is tragic such as this. So, but what really threw me in this story is just how dark and twisted and shocking it became. And it became quite fast paced, almost like a thriller towards the end with a really shocking ending. So I gave this five stars. If you can find this at the library, I'd really be interested to hear what you thought of it because again, like I mentioned, I'm not sure if it's just, you know, I wasn't anticipating it to be this good. So therefore, and there was no hype surrounding this book because it isn't well known. But anyhow, I gave it five stars. I enjoyed the reading experience and it gave me a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, so that's that one. The next one that I read was Sandlands by Rosie Thornton. So if you guys remember, this one took place in Suffolk and all of these stories have have to do with like nature, animals, and the land. And some stories that's more prevalent and in some it's just little touches of that within. And they all sort of have a common th theme of linking the past to the present and how we are all connected to the land and animals. Uh, but I guess it's so tough when you're rating short stories because some of them you're naturally going to connect with more than others. There were three though that really stuck out to me in this. Um, the first one was The Watcher of Souls and that one is about a woman who gets drawn into the depths of the forest. An owl leads her to a tree and in the tree there is a pile of letters from the past and it ends up being like a love story and it's really emotive and sad and heartbreaking. So I absolutely love that one. There was another one called, I think, the, yeah, The Nightingale's Return which is uh, a man who goes to visit these nightingales because it echoes the sound of a lost loved one. So that one was really beautiful as well. I'll give you kind of a sample of just the writing style because her prose is really beautiful. Um, so this is when he's talking about the nightingale and he calls it the voice of heaven angel bird. And he says, as he stood, he closed his eyes and let his mind trace out the melody as it rose and fell. He knew no other bird which could combine within a single phrase that round, full-throated tone like a thrush or a blackbird before soaring up as impossibly high as the trilling of a skylark. But his favorite of all was a low bubbling warble, a note so pure and liquid clear you felt refreshed to hear it. 
as if you could actually drink the spring water that the sound resembled welling fresh from the rock. It was just, it's, there's no doubt that these stories are beautifully written. Um, so I recommend it for that in general, but I seem to connect with only three of them and the others I didn't so much. So it's tough because she can write. And there are other short story collections that I read this month, which I'll show you soon, which I felt like the writing was absolutely lacking. So I'm thinking this is about three and a half stars, even though if you're just basing it solely on the writing, it is, you know, four or five star writing. So um, there's that. The next one that I read was Heroines of the Medieval World by Sharon Bennett Connolly. And this book has everything that I should like in it. I love the medieval time period. I was really excited to learn about, uh, especially the women, because they were so suppressed politically within the home, etc. So it had everything that I thought I would love. Unfortunately, the execution was poor, in my opinion. I felt like her writing style and the way she organized this book really hampered the reading experience. So it's organized not by each woman, but sort of by each topic. So for example, in one chapter, she'll have um, all the scandalous heroines, all the warrior heroines, um, heroines in religion, heroines in the literary world. And so you're often reading quite a few people within each chapter and she is obsessed with lineages and I understand that too because there's not a lot that you have to, um, you know, we don't have a lot of documentation so we're relying on birth, death certificates, marriage certificates, all of that. And so there was often paragraphs where she would just be listing each person who their siblings were, who they were married to, and who they birthed, and what dates. And it was so dense and so dry that you got very little of the actual story. And because it was organized in subjects, some of those families would repeat throughout the novel, so you were almost just reading redundant things throughout. Um, I will say though that there are a couple people in here that are more prominent, that we have a little bit more information about, and that kind of triggered me to want to learn more about them. So Eleanor of Aquitaine and Joan of Arc, those chapters flowed, or those segments sort of flowed a lot better because there was more you could say on what they did. Um, but otherwise, it was just, I would say this was two, two stars, honestly. She knows her stuff, and that's really the sad part. But uh, like I said, the whole the whole style of how she put it together just made it fall flat for me and it was really unenjoyable actually. <laughs> okay, so this next one was The Ark That I Had Been Sent in Its Lands and Forest by Andrew Forbes. And this is tough for me because this story deserves, a, or this short story collection deserves a lower rating. It had poor writing and I didn't connect with any of the stories. Whereas Sandlands for me had beautiful prose and, but I only connected with really three of the stories. So it's just so hard because I feel like she deserves more. Um, whereas this was bad. <laughs> I feel like he's trying to be a writer and you can really feel that he's trying and he's just not there yet. And every story is trying to do a lot. It's trying to have a beginning and a middle and an end. And I prefer almost little poignant glimpses in moments. And uh, I think they can just be so much more telling and more meaningful and insightful. And this was just, you know, maybe a fractured family and they lost their child and their negligent parents and I just didn't care. And there was a lot of like, you know, he'd talk about smoking joints and I just thought, oh my God, the way he's writing this is almost from experience and you can just feel like he's trying to sound like he knew how to do this and he's I'm like okay you're cool bud um but yeah I didn't enjoy this at all I gave it two stars I don't know how I made it through but I did so that is that so the next one I read was The Great Level by Stella Tillard and I enjoyed this book. It's a really beautiful book. It follows a Dutchman in 17th century England and he is hired on as an engineer to drain and level this marshland. And he's really not in it for the profit like the businessmen are, but he is so passionate about his career as an engineer. And he really understands the land and the flow of water and what he needs to do. He's very curious and he speaks so highly of his job. So I really like that aspect, especially I enjoy reading books about kind of the development in those years. Um, and along with that, because he's in nature all day long and out in the elements, you get a lot of beautiful nature descriptions. That was probably the part of the book that shone for me the most. 
He's also feeling in his new town that he is an outsider, he never really belongs, and sort of gets a sense that he's being watched, and he is by this woman who is watching him. She seems to have quite a connection to the land and understands that the water and the flow of water will always win. So they're sort of at battle with each other because he is trying to divert this water flow and she is more in protecting the marshland. Um, and their kind of relationship evolves throughout the story. You find out a lot more about her and her backstory at the end, so I don't really want to go into that too much. I will say I wish she had more of a voice throughout this because I think that would have been really interesting. My only qualm really with this book is there is some pacing issues and the middle seem to be a bit slow as well as um, the female character not really hearing a lot about her until the very end of the story. So for that I gave it three stars. It's just not a book that I think I'm going to be thinking about a lot and one that's really going to stick with me. Um, but it was still a good read. The next book that I read was Dun Cow Rib. This is by John Lister Kay and this was a book that I, it's short stories but I think when I had read the blurb to you guys, and maybe you thought this too, I thought it would be strictly just nature short stories, but it's a lot more of a memoir on his life. I enjoyed it though. I gave it four stars. Um, you kind of see him in his boyhood. He lives in this manor house. So you sort of read a bit about the estate and his family history and his relationship with animals growing up, how back then hunting was still like quite gratuitous and he sort of developed a bond with animals which led him into a career in conservation. So you also have essays in here on his conservation projects with the wild cats in the highlands, which I found fascinating just because of my science background too. Um, but then he also had, although he had a privileged life, he still had some sad moments. His mom had rheumatic fever. So there's a lot in here about, um, her being in the hospital and undergoing constant surgeries. And he was just sent to a boarding school. So it's quite sad. There's a lot of emotion and their relationship was really strong. They often wrote letters to each other. So those are in here as well. And they had, it was just really touching. They had little codes to each other. Like I L Y would be written in the margin for I love you and it just reminded me of my mom so it was really sweet. Another aspect that I really enjoyed about this book is that because the mom was battling a heart condition she was you really kind of got an insight into the development of cardiac medicine and I worked in a cardiac critical care unit back at home um, and it was just it was neat to see the progression I guess and how sometimes they'd be delivering this diagnosis at the bedside with this almost religious reverence and they really didn't know the outcomes of what they were telling people but you know the family would just take it wholeheartedly and go with it and um but yeah it was just you know the different surgeries and the anatomy was very present in here which might be dry for some other people but for me it fascinated me I think the writing was beautiful and it was an emotional read I gave it four stars actually so I still hi highly recommend it but just don't expect it to be just entirely nature focused. It's very much his, his life and his family history. So the next three books that I read, I didn't actually end up enjoying at all. So I won't go into too much detail and bore you with that. But the first one was Heyday by Mar Marnie Woodrow. This follows two different storylines. So you're following two females that fall in love at a roller coaster park where they meet and then also two people who are unhappy in their marriage. And I just found that the chapters are just extremely short, like sometimes only a couple paragraphs. And I was just so jarred going back and forth. I never connected and found any of the relationships meaningful. There were some kind of touching scenic moments in Toronto that brought back some memories. But other than that, it just wasn't for me. Um, the other disappointing one that I ended up DNFing halfway through, which I'm sad about, was the Guru Guru Pledge. I was just really hoping to learn something new and maybe I thought it was more of a non-fiction account because it's about migrants who are attempting to scale the walls and gain asylum on European soil and the cover makes it look like it's almost going to be a non-fiction account and what it ended up being was a lot of fantastical tales that I wasn't really gaining much out of or understanding and like I said I read more than half of it and I wasn't clicking with it and had no desire to pick it back up so I did DNF that one. And then I read Eulogy by Ken Murray. 
This is an interesting read, but I didn't like it. Um, the premise is different. It starts out with a boy who is growing up in a very religious household, almost cult-like, and his parents are unhappily married, and it's very well known that they do not like one another. The mom is extremely religious, and she also seems to have some mental health issues, and the father openly just dislikes her throughout. And in the first few pages, they end up dying because their car is driven off of a bridge. And you learn right away, the son says, you know, despite it being in the obituary and at the church being deemed an accident, he says this very much wasn't an accident. So he has to go to a church where he is very unwelcome because he's never really fit in. He's quite different. Um, and read this eulogy where he's just attacked by the people at the church instead of being supported through such a difficult time. And it kind of then goes back to his boyhood and his, you know, his youth. So you learn a lot about, there is self-harm in this. He is asexual, but it's not really talked about. It just sort of is. And then he kind of finds a girlfriend and you don't really um, explore any of that. There's no actual meaning to it. It's just a very dark book, a very depressing book. The town is depressing. The household is depressing. And I think maybe based on what I was going through too, I just, I, I wasn't, I wasn't into it. So I gave it, I think two and a half stars. So, um, but it's not terribly written, just, just not for me. Okay, so the next four, I'm just gonna show them to you here briefly because I'll link to you the video where I've reviewed them in depth. I would say, this was for the 24 and 48 hour readathon, so I was quite proud of myself that uh, I was able to read books with slightly heavier subject matter. Um, but my favorites were Ruby and Bluebird Bluebird. So I will have that video down below if you want to learn a little bit more about those ones. So the next book was the pick for the Book Naturalist Club and this is hosted by Heidi and Doris. And I wish I could have participated more, but again, because of what happened towards the end of the month, I'm just glad I read it and I'm sorry, I'm gonna try and be more active on social media and they had a lot of good uh, Instagram discussions going on. But this is a memoir of A Colored Man Love Affair with Nature by J. Drew Lanham, and it's just a really special read. I fell in love with it just even in the introduction where it says, for all who wander and love the land, and that is just, it speaks to me. This book is a lot about uh, coming of age and growing up in the South and also developing a career in a predominantly white field. He works at Clemson University in ecology, specifically ornithology is his main interest. So there are so many beautiful descriptions and the prose is very beautiful. I read in some reviews it's described as a little too flowery, but for me, I just clicked with it. I found it fascinating. And he really talks about how land is sort of the tie that binds us together. and. He has a chapter sort of discussing the red clay and how he can just feel it in his, it runs through his blood. And that was such a, an emotional chapter for me because I just moved to the East Coast and my family is born and raised here, but they raised me elsewhere. And I felt like this was that little piece of me, like the ocean and the water was that piece of me that's been missing this entire time. So I can completely um, relate to those moments in this book. And you know, even his conflicting feelings with having such a connection to the land where, you know, his own people were enslaved to this land. So there are two quotes in here I'm just gonna quickly read. I wrote them down on a paper, so I'm gonna just be looking down, but it says, um, I have yet to have a wild creature question my identity. And another one where he's reflecting on nature, he says, a sanctuary for creatures that aren't subject to the prejudices of men. And those were just really poignant. I think even if you own a pet and maybe you aren't out in nature all the time, you know that they always love you even at your worst moments and they have no outside influences. They just are and you know, there is no judgment in their mind. So I, I just really, I, I really found those to be meaningful little passages. I wrote down a lot of quotes in my notebook. Um, he also talks about his homestead and his family history, his youth. There's some funny stories with his sister and he gets in a car accident and flips the car in this storm. And you know, it's sort of a secret that they keep between each other. So there's just really beautiful moments as well as a lot of reflection on nature. 
I absolutely loved it. It's very poignant and emotional and um, I highly recommend it. I read two actual memoirs by black authors that I really enjoyed this month, but I gave this one four out of five stars. Okay, so the next book I read is a novella. You could probably read this like in an hour and a half, hour and a half in one sitting. It's a translated work called The Day the Leader Was Killed. It's by Negib Mathuz, translated by Serjana, and it takes place in Egypt, um, early 1980s, and you're following a middle-class family. They are under the reign of President Anwar al-Sadat. It's a very corrupt economy and very oppressive. You're following this family that's just really working so hard to meet ends meet, so it's very heart-wrenching that way. They don't get to eat the meals that they traditionally were used to in the past. They're trying to be very frugal with their spending. But it's even more than that. I mean, two people who fall in love can't marry one another because they wouldn't be able to survive a life together because they're both so poor. So one person is forced to marry someone wealthier and it just ends up in a really kind of sad, I don't even know if you could call it a love story. Um, there's other little poignant parts where, you know, a son feels that he's almost an orphan because he is, he never sees his mom and dad. They're always busy working, even though they're alive and well, he just still feels like an orphan. So a lot of really touching, um, heavy moments within this book that is told through three narrative perspectives. And it all kind of culminates when that president is assassinated. So I recommend it. I gave it four to five stars. The next book I read is a short story collection called Shut Up You're Pretty uh, by Tia Motenji. And this is a beautiful cover. Um, I took this one out of the library because it sounded interesting. It is, it's blurbed as a short story collection and on the back they sound like very different points of view from very different characters. However, when you're reading this, it sounds very autobiographical and it reads that way in chronological order as well. So the author's bio in the back, it says that she moved to Canada from the Congo in, um, to Scarborough, which is exactly how this book begins with as a young girl moving to kind of a complex as a new immigrant and she gets sucked into a very dark life. So these stories are very raw and depressing and they're overtly sexual. Um, I found it extremely hard to read at times, but what was so difficult was I was like constantly torn between this feeling like it should be a nonfiction read about her life and then yet it is fictional book so it just was confusing um, and I just couldn't connect with these stories I don't know if I'm just too I don't know innocent background or whatever but it was mind-blowing some of the things that were happening to me sometimes they felt a little bit too much but maybe this is her reality so that again was like that whole feeling of is this fiction or is this non-fiction and what is the point if it is fiction then because there was no um, I guess like explanation or reflection or redemption in the end of it all so anyways I just gave it I think I gave it two and a half stars um, and it didn't impact me as much as I think it should have the next book I read was heavy an American memoir by Casey Lamon and this is a five-star read for me I encourage everybody to pick this book up it was just deeply impactful it's a memoir of his life but written as a letter to his mother and it talks about growing up as a black boy and you know developing a career as a professor his relationships throughout the way the lies the secrets the sexual violence there is just so much trauma in here it's so raw and personal and it's almost you know has sentences in here that we shouldn't even have access to we should not be privy to these things so it was um it's my pleasure to read something so incredible and thank you for being so vulnerable on the page knowing that so many people would be reading this. Uh, I wrote down countless notes in my book about this. Um, I'll read you some of the quotes. It says, America seems to be filled with violent people who like causing people pain but hate when those people tell them that, that pain hurts. I wonder if the memories remain with age are heavier than the ones we forget because they move us or if our bodies, like our nation, eventually purge memories we never want to be true. And then even more here. I thought about how even when we weren't involved in selling drugs, big dark folks like us could be used to shield white folks from responsibility. And this was another um, impactful sentence. It says here, I waited in the parking lot of my apartment for a white woman walking out of the complex to get into her car so I wouldn't scare her. 
But here we are in one of our safe places watching white folk watch white police watch other white police destroy our body. It is just a deeply personal memoir. It reminded me a bit of Roxane Gay's Hunger, not simply because these are two black authors that have gone through trauma in their life and not simply the connection with weight throughout the book, um, but because there are just poignant moments that will stick with me for the rest of my life that impact the way I think, that, that will forever impact the way that I act. Um, I know Heavy, uh, or sorry, Hunger with Roxane Gay's book changed the way I dealt with a certain pediatric population. It gave me an entirely different outlook and uh, at work. And this is sort of the same. Um, just a really important book that is extremely well written. The ending is just fabulously tied up in something that will stick with you forever. Uh, a five star read. Please go check it out. I'm actually going to leave a link below from another booktube video that did an entire review on Heavy and she has a lot more time to dissect the book because there's just so much you could talk about and like I said it deserves its own video but I don't have time in this wrap up so I'll put that down below if you are interested in it. The final book that I read was a classic. I read The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, my first Wilkie Collins. Um, I haven't read The Woman in White, so let me know if you've read that and if you recommend it. But this was this was this was a fun mystery. I mean, I think you have to go into it with a very Victorian frame of mind because this was one of the foundational mystery novels, and these tropes were unique. And now maybe you've heard them a million times, but back then these hadn't really been written in this way. It's about a diamond that's given, it's taken from India, but given to Rachel for her birthday, which is one of the female characters. And she is told, you know, you should protect this. People should be guarding this diamond. And she kind of decides that she trusts everybody in the house and she's just going to store it in a chest of drawers. And she wakes up in the morning and the diamond is gone. So you then follow all of these narrative perspectives from suspects and witnesses that were there either in the house or connected to this at some point and all of their theories on what happened to this diamond. I think a lot of people have DNF this book because it does slow down there and you know you're expecting it to be more of a fast paced mystery like we have today. But what I appreciated I guess was like Wilkie Collins' humor and his wit throughout. There's lots of drama and a little bit of romance. He also writes female characters really well so um, I want to read more of his work. I gave it four out of five stars but let me know what else you guys recommend by him. And that's it for my February reads. Please tell me your hits and misses. How was your reading month? Did you have a good 28 days? Um, recommend me some books below if you feel like it. It is super sunny out, blue skies in New Brunswick right now, five degrees out, which is rare for this time of year. So I should probably go out and take advantage of it. <laughs> um, but tomorrow I'm gonna be starting March, March of the Mammoths. So I might do a few little videos here and there, maybe some reading vlogs or, you know, tag videos and that kind of thing, because I'm so excited to dive into those big chunky books. Um, I can't wait. And I will see you all soon. Again, I hope you're well, and I will talk to you later. I love you guys. Bye-bye.